This is The Outlook. LGBTI news, views and culture brought to you by News Hub. Welcome to The Outlook, where news, views and culture brought to you by right in here, the inside of News Hub. Joining us today, we have Tony Duda from Rainbow Youth, Stephen Oates from Everywhere, Courtney Act is joining us later on as well, and from the sports department, we have Stephen Foote. How's it going, oh, everyone? Happy to be here, Dan. That's good. I'm not the only Stephen. I'm the only P, I'm the only V, he's a PH. The, we, the lesser of the Stephen. We discussed yeah. that earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there, the is there a heritage? Stephen. Like... A heritage, like where the who had the V's and who had the PHs, like no, the real ones had the V's. Oh, the real ones. Ooh, <laughs> oh, controversial. Oh. <laughs> Damn. And then we're going to start off with the the news part, and obviously the story doing the rounds at the moment is Israel Folau, and he's due to go head to head with the Aussie Rugby Union on May the fourth. May the fourth not be with him. Uh, his career appeared to be all but over last week when Rugby Australia CEO Raylene Castle said he had breached a social media clause in his contract, only to find out he didn't have one. So, see, Stephen Foote, you are the expert when it comes to these sorts of things. What's the latest on the situation for this guy? As you said, May the 4th is the big turning point where we're going to edge towards some sort of resolution here. Um, having said that, there is a possibility that regardless of the outcome, they could still go to some sort of legal pre- um, proceedings um, as a result of whatever that decision may be. But I think, I mean, either way you look at it, Falau's on pretty shaky ground. Raylene Castle has, she may not have had that social media clause injected after his comments last year, which were pretty vehemently anti-gay yeah. marriage. But they did apparently have some sort of handshake and verbal a- agreements. Um, there was something else stipulated in regards to social media. don't know how official that was. But Raylene Castle will be arguing, hey, you've, you've really stood on all the core values that you agreed to sort of adhere to as part of your contract. And furthermore, after last year's discretion... So I think I think you, you say the ball's really in Rugby Australia's court, and I think Falau, he's going to be struggling. He's the put mm. it that way. I mean, you know, the, the the initial clause says something along the lines of he needs to have some sort of quote unquote um, uh, moral reasoning or sort of mitigating right. sorry mitigating factors. That's is right. what he said Mid- yeah. uh, for the reasoning behind the the post. I mean, it's short of being hacked, and we all know that that's a <laughs> that's a typical Falau post. Uh, yeah. He's not going to be able to argue that. No. I um, mean, can use the basis of religion, but even then, I mean, there's some. It's you know, it's pretty dicey around those parts as well. You you probably know better than any of us here. I would mm. I imagine. I don't want to assume too much, uh, but you probably know more about the sports world and the players' jobs and things like that. What do you think he's going to keep his job, or do you think he'll they'll get rid of him? I think I think they'll get rid of. I mean, even if he does come through this and his his, his contract remains intact and he can keep playing for rugby uh, rugby for Australia, I mean, think about his teammates. Think about the awkwardness involved there. His coach Michael Check has already said that he's not going to pick him again. That you know they can't have a guy like that who's about such, so, you know has those sorts of viewpoints towards society in general can be on their team. His vice captain uh, Will Guinea has come out and said that it was kind of selfish what he did and he can't really see a world where he's going to come back into the environment and really be welcomed. Um, Michael know, Hoop has been outspoken against it and even David Pocock. Yeah. You know, David this Pocock, is he's thing. a real campaigner this for, for great, all that sort of this stuff. This is the great thing in that you, you are getting these, a lot of, you know, for, for the one for Lao, you're mm. getting a whole bunch of people who are pushing back and, and um, standing up for um, LGBT rights and it's, and it's actually mm. very heartening. But um, when does his contract naturally end? How long has he got to go? He's got he a four-year deal. I think he's... I Four think years. He, I think he has a Long. couple. I think it'll probably be fairly, fairly freshly signed. I'm so I should I should know that, but it, it is at least two years left and on that deal. Millions, isn't it's worth It's worth four million dollars a so, year or in total. In total, mm-hmm. and obviously it's a huge year for the Wallabies. It's the World Cup. He's their best player. He's been their best so, player for okay. three years. So here's another question for you, because um, I, I don't really follow Australian rugby. Sure. Um, so is he actually a good player? He's remarkable. He's, he's phenomenal. He's an amazing player. So yeah, this he's is, phenomenal. This is the, he's not. He's not just like some. No, he's no. like. Uh, I mean, is he like a Dan Carter yeah. kind of? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He's it's been like the real shining light in Australian rugby for the last few years, where it has been struggling a lot yeah. um, in between World Cups. And you know, is this why this is such a big deal? Exactly. Oh, well, yeah, part of the reason. Yeah, it's massive. It's massive. And I mean, think about his teammates and how annoyed they would be. You know, you, you're losing yeah. your, your key strike player in such a critical year. Um, I mean, yeah, it's hard to hold not, not to hold a grudge there. I'd think if he he's obviously fighting for something. It's hard to use the word, is he fighting for pride? 
But is, or is he fighting for money? Like, does he think, well, my career's pretty screwed now. Um, I may as well get some cash yeah, out of it Yeah, maybe he's trying on. to get some sort of settlement out of this. I mean, he, he's being very open in saying that, hey, he's not going to apologize. He's firmly standing on his ground. He's, he's taking religion over, over rugby every single time. Um, as to how that sort of plays out, I'm not too sure. But, yeah, maybe some sort of settlement is what he's after here. I mean, I can't believe he – I mean, I can't see him being able to take any sort of moral high ground. Although it has been kind of disturbing seeing the, the sort of a, a late sort of burst of support behind Israel for I'm sure, I'm petitions sure, popping I'm up sure, and the like. I'm sure he's got people all around and, yeah, you did the right thing. You know, this is God's word. You're just Pulling telling, you're just telling the truth. But, you know, he's obviously coming from that um, – that yeah. support network, you know, don't tell him what you can't think. This is Jesus. This is God. These people really yeah. believe this. Yeah. Even like not even overly religious people, just people who are looking for an excuse mm. to be homophobic. That's right. Like, just going to be like free speech. Yes. You should be able to, I don't, I'm not religious, mm. but free speech. It's like, I'm not racist, but free speech, man, yeah. I can say yeah. what I want. There has been some disturbing comments popping up on the old new Subsport Facebook. <laughs> I'll say that much, even on the main Facebook page as well. But I mean, having said that, Will Genia, he's also a devout Christian and he's, you know, he's obviously been pretty object, um, sort yeah. of stunned by what Flowers come out and said. And, you know, he said, hey, well, you can't really say it like this, you know. There's other ways, you know, you can have your beliefs. Um, but after what happened last year, he told Michael Chick, he told Raylan Castle that he wouldn't have these sorts of outbursts mm-hmm. again. And as Genia rightly pointed out, that's a massive breach of trust there. Yes. Like, how are you going to rebuild that relationship with them, let alone the, his teammates? And it's yeah. not about free speech. It's about your platform, right? It's just mm-hmm. about how wide you can share your views. And they're so And hateful. he has a massive, massive And he has platform. a huge one. When, when uh, he plays against the All Blacks, who is like his one-on-one opponent? Who does? Oh, it'd probably be, be Ben Smith if you're going okay. fullback versus fullback. Right. But you know he pops up anywhere in the back line. He's kind of that destructive yeah. type of player they want to use all the time. So, it's, so it's because mm. you know I don't condone violence or anything. But if he was to turn up at Eden Park for the Wallaries when they next play the All Blacks, I'd um I'd quite like to help that player do some training and absolutely. And yeah, I like that's, 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 uh, on you're, the first no, tackle. You're inciting violence. Yeah, do you um, think there might be some sort of I backlash from crowds? Well, actually, I'd, ha- last what time, would that look like? Last time he, uh, well, he'd get, definitely get booed, but last time he was going to come here, I had arranged for a whole group of people with rainbow flags and glitter to welcome the Wallabies bus <laughs> at Eden Park, oh, but then, <laughs> the then, uh, then I think he got pulled with it from the team because he was injured. So, oh, right, you've got to bring that back. If he yeah. somehow emerges from all of this unscathed and plays for Australia, again oh dan i we so gonna make that happen i think i'll be so angry i'll get to the point where i will cover myself in rainbow body paint and streak <laughs> or something i'll be that annoyed that's not a commitment though that's just a thought <laughs> no that was a promise <laughs> hey St- uh, Stephen, thanks so much for coming in and telling us uh, and getting us all updated on that situation and we will definitely have you back once it's an ongoing it's, it's an yeah, ongoing story a pleasure I'd love to come back it's a bit of cross, uh, podcast sort of um, crossover yeah, here yeah tell us about yours oh, I, oh sorry I wasn't trying to angle for a plug there <laughs> but the, the Fight Club yep. everything you need to know from MMA and the combat sports world find that podcast where you find this fantastic podcast as well and the yourself. Fight Club the, the Fight Club the audience crossover <laughs> is like, huge I'm sure uh, <laughs> wait a minute we're talking about like cage fighters and things yeah exactly I'm Oh God, Boxing. Can I come to your podcast? <laughs> sure. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen, thanks so much. Thanks, team. Cool. Thank thanks. So I also want to talk to you, uh, Tony, about uh, the damage that reading, hearing, seeing these things online can do specifically to young people. We've talked about this before, but given it's in the headlines again, um, like you said, it's reinforcing those people who th- think it's okay to think that way. What damage can be done? Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge considering how much of a sporting nation we are. Um, there's not much wiggle room in terms of um, who you have to look up to if you're a sports player. They're all blacks and wallabies. So uh, the damage in terms of like role models, seeing your role models being able to get away with this in the first instance, maybe not this instance. Um, but also I think we need to be talking about our Pacific community and our, our young Pacific community because – these people are seen as huge runaway successes in their communities. And um, this, you know, you can see there's a little bit of the community wrapping around to protect that person. And, and it's understandable in some ways. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak, like, enough about the lack of um, role, like the, the role model aspect and 
if this is who you're looking up to and this person's saying this stuff. Even if you're not LGBTIQ, if you're just... Uh, if you're the school bully yes. Yes, who's calling is, kids fag yeah. and your, mod- your, your role model and hero st- agrees with you, basically, it gives you full vindication and um, more license to mm. go to school the next day and carry on with that behaviour. And let's yeah. not pretend that homo and fag aren't classic words thrown around. I mean, Common. you go to any Saturday rugby game and you'll hear them. Oh, yes, you yeah. sure do. Although I, I really do like in stadiums like Eden Park now, they have a text system where if you hear any language like that, you text them what you've heard and what seats it came from mm. and they evict the people. So I, that's can cool. I, also, I wish... All rugby games were yes. held at Eden Park then. Yeah. <laughs> can I? Can I? Can just on the uh, on the flip side, I do feel that professional rugby, particularly around the All Blacks and rugby at that level, I feel they are becoming trying to be more inclusive. Yes. Do you know, what I, mean? I feel like I would feel quite. I mean, I've been with you to All Blacks games, yeah, and, and you know, in those environments, sometimes I, you know. Kind of t- play it up a little bit. Yes, go girl. We were. I think we were mildly dressed as clowns on that one occasion. Yeah. No, but um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like I do feel like I feel I would feel really comfortable at an All Blacks game. Yes. Maybe if I was going yeah. to, um, you know, like you're saying, a, more, a grassroots one, grass, yeah. more grassrootsy. Um, you know, I would probably be more a little bit more aware of you know my surroundings and maybe be a bit more uh, subdued. Although um, I go to a lot of the um, the Falcons games, yeah. um, and they play um, you know straight teams. But of, of course, like they know yeah. the Falcons are there, and everyone knows the Falcons are there, and so it's a little bit um, you know it's yeah. people already know yeah. the, know what the deal is. But I, I, I do think it's improving. Yeah. yeah, I think that urban rural divide again, and so many, especially Completely. like the work that we do at Rainbow Youth, they're huge. You know, like mm. we recently went down to Southland, and they said to us, like, we're ten years behind you guys. Like mm. in our attitudes, in our social attitudes. Now you think about what ten years ago was. I mean, mm. marriage equality wasn't yeah. around. You know, it was. It, it's so that's scary, and so yeah. it is those provincial rugby games Sorry, where I'm like, that stuff. You, if you're, a, you wouldn't be out. Yeah. As a queer rugby no, no. player no. at no. all, but not- in those definitely bigger. Yeah. Um. It I, is, and I guess it helps when it's in Auckland. Makes uh, me cynical, though. I have to say, like. Where is this coming from? You know, yeah. what changed between the first year that Falau said this and the second year? Well, I think um, uh, stars starting to talk out about it. So I'll quickly make a comparison about feeling comfortable at sports games. Like I do at the All Blacks games. When I go to the V8 supercars, definitely do not. But <laughs> yeah. with the All Blacks, I, I know that there's a long way to go in terms of everything with equality everywhere and equality in sport especially. But I don't think that means we shouldn't celebrate what we've already achieved. And there was a game, I think it might have even been in response to Falau, where the All Blacks wore rainbow laces on Mm. all of their boots. And, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I had a bit of a tear in my eye hearing that because that is a huge step. You imagine the All Blacks now telling the All Blacks of even 10 or 20 years ago... They were going to do that. They were going to do that. Yeah, they'd get laughed off. You know? And now they are... um, Like, TJ Perinara Perinara talking out quite openly about Mm. the fact that... um, I love him. him. Oh, same. Yeah. Marry him any day. But that's a whole (laughs) other story. So it's really good that... uh, I think it is that players are starting to speak out because of their friends, their families. They know that it's not right to hold those opinions. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's still the fact that the Falcons aren't sponsored by NZRU to go to the World Cup. That might be the next step. But we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. Hey, are either of you guys fans of Courtney Act? I love Courtney. She's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, in my years of watching uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Which Dan a, does not watch. I was a big fan of uh, Courtney. Yep, yep. I'm not a fan of... Ru- well, I haven't really watched RuPaul's no, Drag Race as we hear in every single bloody episode. But uh, her herself, bit of a fan. But there has been outrage across the Tasman this week after Courtney Act placed second in the final of Australia's, Australia's Dancing with the Stars. The Daily Mail compiled a montage of shocked judges' faces under the headline, She Was Robbed. The final episode of Dancing with the Stars comes just days after the premiere of Courtney's new show called The By Life. 
The BiLife focus on, focuses on bi, pan and fluid sexual people going on dating experiences. The 10-part dating series follows a group of bisexual plus or questioning British singletons on an adventure to find love abroad. Despite the long days and the nights on the dance floor, Courtney Act did take the time to speak to us here at The Outlook. I began by asking her what her next step was on her path to world domination. What's left on the list for you to do? What are your dreams that, you know, you've ticked off so many things, so what's next? I'd like to do variety a variety TV show. I did um, a Christmas special on Channel 4 in the UK, um, which was really fun. It was like old school variety, like the Sonny and Cher show, the Carol Burnett show, uh, the Judy Garland show. They were sort of my inspiration. Yeah. Um, and so doing a one-off of that was really amazing. But now the goal is to... Um, do that sort of as a regular thing with dancers and with special guests and music acts and <laughs> doing duets with special guests and things like that. Oh, I know exactly the kind of show that you mean and uh, you know they're great and yeah. uh, it's funny you say you did that in the UK and I've been having conversations lately about the difference between British and American comedy and how British comedy is a lot camper and a lot more open to that sort of comedy. You wouldn't get that kind of show in the USA, do you think? Well, they definitely they definitely have a different relationship and different sensibility to Australian and New Zealand um, audiences. Um, and even, actually just last night, I was watching Dancing with the Stars back and I filmed a couple of snippets of Amanda Keller where um, Grant Daniel, the host, was saying, oh, there's uh, these two, even though it's Italian, even though it's Latin night, these two have been French kissing. And Amanda Keller was like, well, I'm glad it's not Greek night. <laughs> and just, just so comments like that just would never happen no. in America. They no. would happen in the UK. And they. Um, I was even actually a little bit surprised to hear them in Australia. But the different senses of humour are, are very... Um, the, the difference in sense of humour is very obvious. And I feel like in the US, you might... They've, they've had... They've tiptoed into variety. Yeah. Um, and, like, I know... uh it's a variety show? Was it Bill, Bill Murray had a variety special on Netflix and Maya Rudolph had sort of a... a they started a variety show. But, and they had Saturday Night Live, but I suppose the whole drag queen on, a, on network TV in the US um, is probably a little bit more of a stretch. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I think Rue is doing something on NBC. I don't know if I meant to know that. Um, <laughs> we Rue is got... doing something on NBC coming up, I think. Well, let's move um, on to that. and um, so talk... Might not be far off. Uh, RuPaul's Drag Race has become, yeah. even though it's been around for a while, it is still growing in popularity and... And it seems to have definitely crossed over into the mainstream uh, media and the mainstream um, kind of pop culture. What is it that people Mm -hmm. love about that show? I think they love that... They love the creativity and they love the characters, I think. You know, on on other sort of conflict-based reality shows, you often just see... People fighting or arguing over, yes. I don't know. We do get married at First Sight Australia, so we understand what you mean, yes. <laughs> right. I, haven't even, I actually haven't got around to watching that yet, and I just kept hearing, hearing people talk about math. Math? Math? That, yeah, yeah math. Maths, and I was yeah. like, are people talking about math, but they have lists? I'm not sure what's going on. Um, it's a lot more exciting than math. I feel like me. <laughs> I feel I need to watch it just so that I can remain culturally relevant. But um, <laughs> binge watch. Yeah, I think on Drag Race, people love the, they love the characters. Like the, the girls are also colourful and different and interesting yeah. and and diverse. It's probably one of the most genuinely diverse shows on mm. television. Mm. Um, and then you get to see everybody, you know, being creative, whether it's you know making a garment or putting a performance together. And then you also, you know, get the reality TV drama that, that unfolds as well. And I think more than that, you get to see a whole bunch of people expressing themselves um, in a world that has told them that they shouldn't be that way. Yes, But yes. they still are it anyway. And I think people 
Um, you know, but I think the majority of the audience of Drag Race is women, about two thirds. And I think that women sort of love that there's these, these people defining their own feminine presentation yeah. um, on their own terms. And yes, yeah, self belief and just kind of striving to be exactly what they want to be. Uh, it's one of quite hmm. a few um, reality style shows that you've been involved in. I just actually watched your hmm. um, from Celebrity Big Brother, where you basically explain to the guys. Um, you know the difference between the drag queen and uh, and being trans. You did it really well, actually. So I'm kind of going to keep that link and just send it to people in case they um, ever need it explaining. Uh, and then there was the the skirt incident. Oh yes. How was that? How did you feel? Were you? Yes. <laughs> How did oh, it I feel? mean, I I had the skirt made the night before. Um, because it was originally like a pair of shorts and I was like, oh, I need something a bit more, um, you know, it's opening, I need something a bit yeah. more special than, than sequin shorts. And they had a bit of fabric left and knocked up a quick little skirt and um, it only had two pop studs on it and it fit fine when I was walking around, but then when I walked in. Um, but as it turned out, it was kind of the best entrance ever, really, <laughs> um, because... It went everywhere. I was a meme. I didn't yeah. know any of this. It was on the front page <laughs> of the newspaper all the way in Australia. Wow. Um, and the images that came out of it were quite hysterical. Yeah. And so, hey, you know um, you've made it, it when was, you become a meme, probably, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, the thing is, I think when you become a meme, you can be you can definitely be an overnight success if you're a meme, a flash in the pan. But thankfully, it seemed to have held. <laughs> yes. Hey, Eurovision, I wanted to quickly touch on as well because I'm secretly obsessed with it. Uh, is this something that you've, you still want to do or get involved in? Obviously, you, you um, were in, um, have been involved in it to some level in Australia. Uh, and it's also, yeah. it's interesting how, why do Australians love it so much considering they're not in Europe? Do the Kiwis love it as well? Do you know most people here don't even know it exists? It's really sad. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, I don't know why Australia loves it. It's been on television here for like 30 years, I think. And, yeah. um, and we just, yeah, we love it. And, and I've always loved it. And I, you know, did Australia decide, hoping to sort of make it into Eurovision. Although, interestingly, doing that performance uh, made me realise that, like, performing live on stage is what I love. Um, it's my favourite thing to do. Um, but I'd say I feel most comfortable with the band and doing that sort of like quite um, rehearsed pop performance yeah. was a lot more challenging than it looks like yeah. wearing you know the costume and doing the choreography even though I kept my choreography light it was quite challenging to do and I I felt like I would much more enjoy sort of being with the band being with live music in front of a live audience so mm. I would definitely still love to do Eurovision and and now that Australia hasn't accepted me, then, you know, I am up for grabs. So I live in the <laughs> UK. My dad was born in Germany. My mum oh. was born in Denmark. So You could I interview have everyone. In Australia. <laughs> I could. Um, finally, we want to talk about the by life. And uh, yeah. I kind of, I, I just really like the concept because I just love it when things push people's perception of that spectrum of straight and gay basically and mm -hmm. I essentially kind of feel yeah. like this is this show is pretty much doing that right yeah and it does it in such a matter of fact way like it might sound like an out there concept to some people I mean it doesn't to me in my little bubble but yeah. I understand that the idea is still not mainstream and then when you watch it I think there's something so matter of fact about the way like you're like oh there's a guy going on a date with yeah. a girl Oh yeah, that that makes sense. And then you're like, oh, there's a that same guy going on a date with a a guy. Oh huh, yeah, that makes <laughs> sense too. It just it. I think sometimes the unknown is the thing that causes confusion. And then when we see those stories being told, especially on television, especially on a network like Bravo, yeah, it's so mainstream. Yeah, you it sort of takes away the mystery and it normalizes it or usualizes it. Yeah. and you're just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And yep. I think. So in some ways, it's sort of educating people or helping people understand that sexuality 
you know, exists on a spectrum as yeah. opposed to a binary. Yeah, I think it's important to um, make it entertaining and, and it's also, you know, the by life is a familiar format, you know, so reality dating show that we've seen but the thing that I do like about my life is that there's no competition yeah so no one's gonna win a hundred thousand dollars or <laughs> you know whatever at the end of the day so they're they're not hopefully their motivation is not to win a prize it's to actually just yeah. go on this adventure and being when we filmed this in Barcelona um it was very much a group of UK Brits UK Brits UK singleton who were all just sort of there to go on dates and see what they could find and different people were at different stages of their own yeah. sort of sexuality journey and you know Irene had never been with someone had never kissed a girl before Michael was had never been on a date before um, and they sort of got to go on those journeys and sort of see it unfold over the course of the week brilliant can't wait to watch it Thanks so much for your time and thanks for joining us here on The Outlook. Uh, so just so you can uh, put it into your my sky, it is on Bravo and it's on, I believe, every weekend. It's called The By Life. Stephen, is that the type of show you would watch? You a bit of diversity being thrown into a dating show? Oh, no, I love to, you know, I think the more diversity on television, the better. And I'm a big fan of Courtney, so definitely I would be checking it out. Yeah. What about you, Tony? Yeah. Totally. I've always, I always, just, I always try and pick the like token gay or token bi person in those reality shows. Yeah. So now it's like, yay. Do but. you remember the show Straight and Married Gay? No. The dating show. It was American. It was on a very small budget, but basically, a woman would date three men, and she would have oh, to pick no. which one was straight, which one was married, and which one was gay. Just when and, you thought reality couldn't get any worse. But, but this was like ten years ago, and it was hilarious how just blind to the obvious signs of, you know, oh, we're going great date, we're going to see sound Do you remember music. there's something about Miriam? No. Come on. Something about Miriam. For your time. Come on. No. It wasn't that You're long You're getting ago. two people shaking. What about shaking. Tequila? Tequila? And she, she was bisexual and she was on MTV and they did like a dating show and men and oh, women yes. had to compete for her and then she came out and she was a Nazi. And <laughs> so I'm oh. really, I think... The market I'm is all, wide open for a non-problematic. I'm, I'm no, all for coming out, but not, not as a Nazi. No, there's something no. about Miriam. It was about ten years ago, and it was a reality show where they put this whole this group of guys, about ten guys, went and lived in this villa in Spain or the Mediterranean on this island, maybe Ibiza or something yep. like that. And they were all competing to to win the hand of yes, Miriam, this, and yes. they'd go on dates with her and challenges, and they were all trying to win, you know, get her to like them. And in the very last episode, she picks the guy that she chooses, and then she reveals to all of them that she's transgender, and they didn't know up until that point. Oh. And, and I'm sorry, guys, I've got something to tell you. I'm, I was, and she, she says, I'm actually a man. Like, and it's just, oh. it's, it's How like, did it go with just, the guy? Uh, he said yes, that he because they want like money and to go on a cruise. Oh. And he said at the time, um, yes, I'll still go on the cruise with you. But then afterwards, um, he he said no, he wasn't going to go. And they, all the guys got together and sued the um, television show for. I'm sure it would have been in their contract. But it, just, it was just such that. objectification of a trans person, yes. and it just so per, per, it just per, per, perpetuated, you know, trans people are, are sexual freaks, and they mislead people yeah, and they're, people they're, on, and they're liars, they're liars, and, and, yeah. and well, they're going to deceive you. I can hear from the Bravo officers, which is just through there that the show is definitely nothing like that so <laughs> it'll be a really 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 good watch moving on from courtney act though the rainbow youth gala is coming up it tickets is. are on sale what's it about so rainbow youth turns 30 this year um, oh my god it's getting old does that mean it has to leave uh, its own organization <laughs> right yeah. i mean i nearly have to <laughs> Um, after this, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're turning 30 and we're holding a swanky gala, which is everything I am not, but that's fine. You can do it, girl. I can do it, and we've got the rest of the Rainbow Youth team. So we're going to have a – it's it's held at the Maritime Room um, on June the 6th, and tickets are on sale on iTicket. And it's pretty much just going to be an awesome time of reminiscing. We've got a massive timeline up on the wall. We're going to have some speeches, um, lots of food and drink and – Entertainment and do you maybe know, do you I know will anything? Speak. Yeah, do you know anything about who will be speaking or who might be performing? We have, um, well, yes, we've got a few um, like young people from Rainbow Youth who are going to be speaking and talk, reflecting yep. on how Rainbow Youth 
changed, uh, helped them. Um, we, at the, the gala is actually hosted by Eli Mathewson. Cool. Who, yeah, he used to work for Rainbow Youth. Um, right. I don't know if he'll be. Yeah, he'll be fine with me saying this. He used to be one of our educators. Oh, yeah. um, so that's exciting. And we're still working on locking in all of the, the kind of entertainment lineup. But yeah. um, it's looking good. And we've got some amazing auction items that are going to be sold at the Ooh, event. So, yeah. That's cool. It's that's gonna very, be very really cool. exciting. I actually might enjoy it. And I'm not a social person. <laughs> are you going to invite all the ex-chair people? <laughs> well, if we did that, we probably would be broke. <laughs> and it is a floating, from so memory, was, it's I a was, floating venue. Yes, that's, I know. We've got some old, awesome old photos of you. Oh. I'm actually not, but I'm, I'm actually not in the country when it's on. Oh. Uh, Bring the photos in next time we we'll okay. see you because yeah. that's a podcast. They're itself. amazing. I'll run them by Stephen first. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> just go for it. Just put them in a Google Drive and send to the, the world. The strange thing is I look older in those photos than I do now. Ah. It's amazing, though, how many Modern medicine. amazing influential people who in came our community through. came through and be yeah. Um, yeah, it's really cool. So. Awesome. So where do people go for information and tickets? Yes. So you can visit our website, www.ry.org.nz. Uh, go to iTicket and search Rainbow Youth 30th Birthday Gala. Where it's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. How much are tickets? $89. Get it? Because so, 89 1989 uh, Yeah. Is it also serving as a bit of a fundraiser? Yes. So primarily we want to celebrate how far we've come, but definitely making some money on the side for our rural um, work that we do. Yeah, and what date is it on? The 6th of June. 6th of June. So Which between like now and then, we have time for you to come back in and remind everyone if there are any tickets left. Yes, definitely. Exactly what's going to be going on. Yes, totally. what kind of things will be in the auction. Yes, yes. I can have some um, sneaky previews for <gasps> that, which will be exciting. We love those. We love those. Yeah. All right, thanks, cool. guys, for cool. coming in. Uh, now, if there's any issues you want us to touch on, email us, theoutlook at mediaworks.co.nz. You can also call and leave a message, 0800 002 898. And then, of course, there is a good old friendly Facebook that doesn't steal any of your information. You can search for us on their News Hub podcasts. Until next time, have a good week. That was The Outlook from News Hub, the latest in queer news, views and culture. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms. The Outlook is presented and produced by Dan Lake and the executive producer is Maggie Wicks.